Hi everyone, welcome to day 10 of Advent of Code 2023. I think today's puzzles are a lot more difficult than the previous few days. It took the 100th person 36 minutes to solve part 2 on today's puzzle. So definitely difficulty is ramping up, but I'm going to go through the explanations of the puzzles and my solutions. But first, let's see a time lapse of me solving the puzzles. Today was a little bit more involved than previous days, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a high-level overview of my solutions. I'm not really going to explain how um, the specific details of the code work, though. If you want to see my code, it will, as always, be linked to in the description, so check that out if you'd like. Otherwise, I'm just going to explain some bits and pieces here and there and just get the overall idea. So today we have a field of pipes, and we need to figure out something about the structure of this, these pipes because an animal crawled in one section, and we need to figure out... Um, basically what the loop is in the pipe system and what the farthest location from the animal is. So basically this pipe is composed of a bunch of characters in a grid. So graph problem you can already see based on the pictures here. Uh, every square in the grid is one of these eight characters. Uh, the vertical pipe character is a literal vertical pipe. Uh, this dash is a horizontal pipe. This L is a 90 degree bend that connects the top and the right. J connects the top and the left. 7 connects the left and the bottom. F connects the right and the bottom. Dot doesn't do anything. And S is the location of the animal. S is actually one of these previous uh, six characters, but we don't know which one it is. We need to just extrapolate that based on what the pipes are surrounding it. So for example, if we have an S here, but we have a dash to the right and a pipe to the bottom, then we know it must connect the right and the bottom and therefore it must be an F because that's what F characters do. Anyhow, the animal starts at the pipe uh, that is labeled S and we need to figure out all the pipes that are connected to this current pipe. We're guaranteed that it forms a loop. So we start at the S and we just figure out all the pipes that are connected to it by basically just traversing around and finding the adjacent pipes. We are guaranteed to come back to where we started. The question is, inside this giant loop, what is the pipe that is the furthest away and what is its distance? So our answer is going to be a number, which is the number of pipes we have to travel to before we get to the furthest one from the animal's start position. So how do I implement this? Let's make the code a little bit bigger. Um, so there is some table here which basically computes the neighbors of every single character. You can tell the neighbors by looking at the character. So for example, if we have this L over here, we know that it connects to the top and to the right. and Basically, yeah, that's it. Um, this function takes in a coordinate and returns all the neighbors of the current pipe using this lookup table. Actually, that's what this function does, but this function over here computes uh, the differentials. So it looks at the current letter and it tells you either uh, the neighbors are one up and one left, or it tells you that the neighbors are, say, one right and one down, depending on what the current character is. S is a little bit more complicated because we need to extrapolate uh, which like basically which pipes connect to it, uh, since we don't know what pipe it is. So to do the S, we look at all of its neighbors, all four of its neighbors, if it has four neighbors, and see if those neighbors have the S as its own neighbor. Uh, that's a little bit contrived, but that's the, here's the code to do it. It's uh, not too complicated. We take advantage of this get neighbors function. This code could be optimized, but essentially what we're doing here is just figuring out what the S is. So at the end of all of that, we will have a system that takes in a current coordinate in the grid, current uh, row and column, and then spits out all of the neighbors of that coordinate as a list. If it's a dot, then there's nothing that connects to it. It's just going to be an empty list, um, but I don't think we're ever going to use that. So. Now we can do our breadth first search, which starts at S. It takes, basically we're maintaining a queue, and this queue is going to store all of the pipes that we have visited so far, or that the pipes that we have yet to visit. So we're gonna start at the S, and we're basically just gonna add stuff to this queue uh, by looking at its neighbors, add it to the top of the queue, and then basically mark pipes as visited as we go, never going backwards. And then eventually we'll end at the uh, furthest pipe because Breadth for search guarantees that. If you're not familiar with breadth for search, I'll leave a link in the description. It's basically a graph search algorithm that allows you to look through a network and uh, iterate through the points distance wise. So the last point we visit is guaranteed to be uh, the furthest node, but also we don't need to necessarily do that because we're going to keep track of what the distances are as we iterate. So that's the second parameter in all of the elements of this list here.
So today is pretty implementation heavy in my opinion. The code is quite detailed, but the big idea is not too difficult. As always, you can check the code in the description if you want to look at those details. But again, today we're just covering big ideas. Now let's take a look at part two. For part two, we need to find the area enclosed by the loop. Specifically, we need to find how many points inside the entire square grid are counted as being looped around. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, there are some examples given, there's no really formal definition, but you can sort of intuit what is going on here. So in this loop example, um, these two dots are inside the loop because the loop starts like at this S and it goes around those two. It does some weird stuff, but then it comes back to the S and at all times, I mean, not at all times, but these two dots stay inside the loop. Whereas these points in the middle here are not inside the loop because the loop sort of goes around them like the other way. Again, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what this means, but you can sort of, um, again, intuit what inside is defined as. Now, things get complicated when we have a very dense loop because when we have, for example, two pipes next to each other, there's no space in between them uh, for an area to be counted. Again, we're counting the number of dots or number of squares in the grid that have that are inside the loop. So it can get really cramped at times and there's like no space in here, but uh, there can be singular dots that peek through and we need to determine whether those are inside or outside of the loop. How do we determine this? Well, we use something called a uh, ray casting algorithm. So this is uh, the point in polygon algorithm and uh, the ray casting algorithm is like one type of point in polygon algorithm. What this will do will it will uh, is it will cast a ray from the point we're trying to determine whether it's inside the polygon or not. It'll cast a ray to the left and it'll see how many times it intersects with the edges of this polygon. If it's even, then it's outside of the polygon. And if it's odd, it's inside the polygon. So why does this make sense? Well, let's take a look at any arbitrary polygon and let's just draw it uh, pretty general like that. This is not the shape of our actual polygon, but it'll suffice. Um, so if a point is inside the polygon, then the number of times it intersects with an edge will be odd. So we can take a look even at weird points like this one. Um, and it'll intersect one, two, three times, that's inside the polygon. If it's outside the polygon, like say here, it'll intersect an even number of times. In this case, for this point, it's two times. Even for weird points like this one, uh, the points are getting really close, but you can see it intersects four times. And that's because every point that's outside the polygon will enter and then exit and then enter and then exit. And for every enter pair, it'll exit the polygon again at another time. For every point inside the polygon, uh, it will exit and then enter and then exit and then enter. And the last one will be exiting. And in total, there's going to be an odd number of crossings. So how do we do that in our case? Well, our polygon is very boxy and square. So for every single point, we just need to look at how many times it intersects with the edge. Seems pretty simple, but there's a lot of uh, sort of edge cases. So let's take a look at this one. Uh, I didn't draw this extremely well, but let's just try to fix that up a little bit. Okay. Um, here we go. Okay, so these coincide and these coincide, but we'll get around uh, to how to deal with that. So if we're just crossing a like direct vertical edge, and that's, in this case, that's going to be a pipe character, then we count that as a single crossing. If we cross something like this, which is like a sort of, it's like a Tetris piece, I don't know what to call it, but in this case, we have a horizontal line and it goes up at one end and down at the other end. This is going to look like an F and then some number of uh, dashes in between and then a J character because this represents something coming from the bottom uh, going horizontally and then going back oh wait this should go up so yeah that does go up so J's go up yes um, the number of dashes might be zero so it might just look like FJ in which case it's going to be very short or there could be a lot of dashes in which case it looks like a very long horizontal line in any of these cases our ray is going to cross the polygons edge uh, once so any FJ or pipes, or actually a, um, I think an L dash uh, seven is going to work as well because that's going to represent coming down and then across and then down again. So that's going to represent another sort of vertical edge that we can cross. If we count all of these, so the number of pipes and the number of FJs and the number of L sevens, then we're going to get the total number of crossings. And again, if it's even, we're outside the polygon. If it's odd, we're inside the polygon. We're casting a ray from the point that we want to tell if it's inside or outside going to the left. Um, and this is just a specific case of the points in polygon algorithm. So 
how we can do this more efficiently is instead of counting all of these characters, we can just look at the number of pipes and the number of J's and the number of sevens or the number of uh, J's and the number of L's. Take any combination you want. I'm using J's and L's. So for part two, we just add this additional function, uh, which counts the number of, I'll say inversions, which really means ed edge crossings uh, from the point that we want to determine whether it's inside or outside uh, to the left. And I'm realizing I pointed to the right there. Um, I actually mean to the left because my camera is inverted. So anyways, ignore that. Um, once we have this, we can successfully determine for every single point, whether it's inside or outside the loop by simply just counting the number of edge crossings. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to loop through all the lines. These comments are not needed. I was debugging and look at how many times it crosses using this handy dandy function. We do need to make sure that for all of the crossings, uh, they are actually part of the loop because again, there's extraneous pipe parts that don't necessarily count as part of our loop, but they're just still there. We can determine which pipes are part of our loop in the breadth first search that we did uh, back in part one. So we're actually going to add, um, actually, we don't need to add anything because we already have a set that maintains all of the crossing, sorry, all of the visited points. So we're just going to reuse that. We need to make sure that all of our crossings actually cross the loop. So again, we're going to verify whether every point uh, that we're looking at the crossings for is actually part of the loop. We're not using that visited set. At the end, we kind of just add it up because we know which points are inside and which are outside. If it's inside, you add one, and that's going to be our final answer, which is the area of the loop. That was a lot to go through. So if you want to check my code, it'll be in the GitHub repository, which is linked to in the description. There's some documentation here in the comments, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask them down below and I'll do my best to respond. Today was a, quite a difficult day, but I hope you got something from this video. I thank you for watching and I'll see you tomorrow for day 11.